Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Dear students, welcome to the 8th lecture in Advanced Topics in Change Management. Today we will discuss about external environment of the organization and how it affects the design and change of an organization. The objectives of today's lecture are to consider how environments vary and affect the internal structures and processes of the organizations. To develop a framework to help assess environments, how they are changing and how managers might need to respond to those changes. So dear students, uh, today we will study in depth about how the external environment basically affects an organization, in particular in perspective of our topic that is change management. We will think about how environments vary and may affect the internal structures and processes of the organizations and we will also develop a framework to help assess environments. We will see how they are changing and how managers might need to respond to those changes. Managing inter-organizational relations, modes of coordination and influence. So we start with how inter-organization relations affect modes of coordination and influence. Uh, the first topic we are going to talk about is how the organizations, they relate to one another in the environment and what sort of modes of coordination and influence they use to counter effect or to counter the effects of the environment or to minimize the effects of the environment on their business operations. First of all, we are going to talk about ownership links, contractual links, that is alliances, joint ventures, etc., interlocking directorates, transfer and exchange of executives and senior managers, profit pooling and federation of firms, cooperative marketing, advertising and public relations, trade associations, obligational contracting, patent exchange and pooling. So these are, you know, some of the very important coordination and influence mechanisms that generally organizations use with respect to one another. So what are they basically? They are organization links, contractual links, interlocking directorates, transfer and exchange of executives and senior managers, profit pooling and federation of firms, cooperative marketing, advertising and public relations, trade associations, obligational contracting, patent exchange and pooling. So now, one by one, we will talk about and, and try to understand with the help of an examples how these uh, different, you know, co coordination mechanisms uh, play their role to control or minimize the effects of external environment. Now we start with ownership links. The ownership links, let's take an example of cross shareholding between Dilemur, Nissan and Renault that they have announced a three-way tie-up. Now, with the help of this example, you must be able to understand how companies try to invest into one another businesses so that they become partners in that particular industry and um, with their collective efforts, they try to minimize the effects of the industry. For example, German car maker Dilemur is to give Renault and Nissan a 3.1 stake in its businesses as part of global tie-up of brands. It has announced. In exchange, Dilemur will take 3.1% stakes in both Renault and Nissan, who have been in alliance six, since 1999. So, basically, what we are trying to say that both you know, German, like three companies, Dilemur, Nissan and Renault, they have decided to cross to, f to share the businesses by holding certain amount of, you know, shares into one another businesses. We st and we have taken example of three, you know, automobile manufacturers, Dilemur, Nissan and Renault. Now, German car maker Dilemur is to give Renault and Nissan a 3.1% stake in his business as a part of global tie-up of the brands. In a similar in exchange, Dilemur will take 3.1% stakes in both Renault and Nissan, 
who have been in alliance since 1999. So what would be some of the advantages of uh, you know, coming up with such a, such a deal? Uh, what would be some of the benefits of getting such a deal, uh, becoming partners in such a deal? The deal will see the companies remain separate but allow them to share technology and development cost. Dilemma Mercedes-Benz will benefit from shared technology. Now, how the companies are going to benefit and how the companies are going to reduce the effects of external environment, they would, though they would remain separate companies, but the deal is going to allow them to share technology and the development costs. And in a similar way, the Dilemma's Mercedes-Benz brand will benefit from shared technology. So, you know, we have talked about that technology is one of the important elements of external environment. Now, you must be quite aware of the fact that technology is changing rapidly these days. So, it's not possible for one company to, you know, keep up with technological changes or to bear the cost of developing new technologies. It benefits them if they can, you know, form sort of some sort of alliance or if they can come up with some sort of contractual obligations to share their resources to develop a common technology which can benefit all automobile manufacturers or perhaps those who have pooled up their resources. There are certain other ownership links examples. For example, Japanese Kalitsua that usually involves shareholding, cross shareholding that is Mitsubishi Kairi Tusa built around Bank of Tokyo Mitsubishi, Mitsubishi Heavy Industries, Mitsubishi Electric, and Kirin Bury among others. Toyota Group built around Tokaya Bank, Toyota, and Recoach among others. Now, these are some of the other examples where you know one particular group has the ownership links or has the ownership rights in many other companies or one, one particular business group has ownership links or ownership rights in many other companies. For example, Mitsubishi is one of very famous companies. So they are built around or the group owns companies like Bank of Tokoya, Mitsubishi, Mitsubishi Heavy Industries, Mitsubishi Electric and Kiran Bury among others. Similarly, Toyota which is a very famous brand is built around brands like Tokaya Bank, Toyota and Recoach among others. Pyramid groups do not necessarily involve cross shareholding. Volkswagen which covers Porsche, Man Trucks, Scania Trucks, Fiat including Fiat, Avico Trucks and CNH. Now some of these groups they do not necessarily involve cross shareholdings but still they, they have ownership links or still the owner is the same for, and they are basically termed as pyramid groups. Now for example Volkswagen it also owns or covers Porsche, Mantrax, Scania trucks. Fiat includes Fiat, Avico trucks and CNH. This is another sort of pyramidic group and to understand it, you can understand it with, with the help of an example. It's another sort of pyramid group and it's called the Arab Malaysian group controlled by Azam Hashim. Now, you can have a look at the slide and you will see that this particular group owns a lot of companies in Malaysia and the Arab world. Now, ultimate owner, who is the ultimate owner? The ultimate owner is Tan Siridato Azman Hashmi. Dan Siridato and Azman Hashmi, they are the two ultimate owners of the group and they own 35% of the whole corporation. They have one company which they control directly which is called Arab Malaysian Corporation. Now this Arab Malaysian Corporation owns certain other groups and the percentages may, can vary from let's for, for example they, they own AMMB holdings they have a share of 34% in AM, AMMB holdings and they have a share of 32% in South Peninsular Industries. Similarly, they have a share of 43% in Arab Malaysian Development Group. Now this is first layer of the pyramid. In the second layer of the pyramid, let's say for example, the Arab Malaysian Development Group 
has a 40%, 41% share in Arab Malaysian property. Similarly, AMMB Holdings and similarly Pyramid 3, there's another company which they have a certain percentage of shares. Like for example, the holding company has certain percentage of shares in it and it's called Global Carriers. Now this is an example of a pyramid where number of companies are basically owned by two partners and they are Tan Siridato and Azman Hashmi and it's called the Arab Malaysian Group. Another example of uh, ownership links or uh, another example of coordination mechanisms is joint ventures. Basically joint ventures are created so that the both partners can benefit from the strengths of the other partners or both partners can benefit from each other's strengths. For example, like in Arab world, a lot of US companies have joint ventures with the Arab companies. The basic purpose is so that the US companies, they find it easier by adopting this strategy to do business in the Arab world. And similarly, the Arab companies can benefit from the advanced technological knowledge of the U.S. managers or the advanced technology the U.S. companies use to, pro to manufacture the products or the services. An example of joint ventures can be an example of equity-based joint venture, Lee Tech Battery, a joint venture between Avonik Industries, which holds 50.1% of the shares in the company, and Dalamar AG, 49.9% share. It develops, produces, and markets large-scale lithium-ion battery cells for automotive applications and battery systems for industrial and stationary applications. Can also have non-equity joint ventures, cooperative agreements to co-develop a business using another company's brand or to develop a technology such as Nokia and Sony Ericsson. Now in joint ventures, you know, there can be some equity-based partner, equity partnerships where both of the partners may share, let's say, certain percentage of the ownership in the company. For example, we have taken an example of a joint venture between Avonik Industries and Dalamur, which basically they have come up with a joint venture to manufacture battery systems for industrial and stationary and automotive applications. Similarly, joint ventures they may be a non-equity joint ventures and they can take the shape of cooperative agreements to co-develop a business using another company's brand or to develop a technology such as Nokia and Sony Ericsson. They have joint forces to co-develop the new mobile technology. Now let's see what are interlocking directorates. This refers to the membership on the boards of directors of two or more firms by the same individual. Example, some Hong Kong companies, Deutsche Bank and Dalamur until early 2000s. So these are what are interlocking directorates where basically the same individual, one or two individuals may sit on the directorates of two or more firms, you know, or the same individual has the membership of board of governors or board of directors of two or more firms. This is quite common in Hong Kong companies and another example can be that of Deutsche Bank and Dalamur. Interlocking directorates, a recent example, Eric Schmidt, CEO of Google, used to have a seat on board of Apple. Not sure if any Apple board member sat on the board of, of Google, but this is a recent example where CE, CEO of Google sits on the board of Apple. Interlocking directorates again can have a look at the you know benefits of having interlocking directorates from different perspectives. For example, does this lead to anti-competitive pra practices? Maybe if uh, CEO of Google sits on Apple board, now maybe they are on friendly terms. They do not compete with one another, or does it does that happen or not? That's a question. Silicon Valley groups face antitrust probe on recruiting. Another example, uh, though interlocking, they have interlocking directorates, but still they poach one another, one another employees. So due to this fact, 
the U.S. Justice Department has begun a civil antitrust inquiry into hiring behavior at some of the largest technology companies in Silicon Valley, including Google, App, Yahoo, Apple, and Genentech. Officials have sent as many as dozens companies civil investigative demands seeking documents that would shed light on whether some of them have agreement not to post talent from one another. Now, if they have uh, underhand agreements because they have interlocking, interlocking direct trades that they would not recruit one another employees, now this comes under the uh, antitrust or anti-competitive practices, but this is against the, you know, the requirements of the government or the government doesn't like such practices which basically hinders competition. So they have, people have filed, uh, uh, you know, civil suits and in response to that the U.S. government is investigating that either due to interlocking directorates such unethical practices are happening among these large joint, uh, giant industry groups or giant technological groups or not. So till now we have talked about like a um, uh, number of things like people like companies they create joint ventures, companies they cross hold uh, shares into one another, companies they you know they can form alliances or they can come up with uh, interlocking direct trades. There can be other examples too of ownership links or uh, coordination mechanism. For example, transfer and exchange of executives and senior managers. Maybe for example, Toyota and General Motors, where to gain experience from one another or to learn the techniques of one another, Toyota sent its managers to GM plants in the US and the U US companies, they send their managers or senior executives to Toyota plants in Japan so they can, so that both companies can learn from one another. Another example can be profit pooling and federation of firms, you know, to raise uh, a common voice against certain decisions of the government, the companies or the businesses generally they form federations like or associations. So like for example, um, in case of Pakistan, uh, CNGS, there's a CNG association, there's a pharmaceutical association, there's, uh, there's a federation of chamber of commerce. So they form these organizations to respond to certain changes in the environment in an effective and timely manner. Companies may come up with cooperative marketing, maybe they come up with uh, a common marketing theme to introduce a product, for example Tetra Pak. Um, a few years ago there used to be you know ads regarding Tetra Pak like what sort of packaging is Tetra Paks and uh, what is the advantage of uh, you know getting your products being packaged in such Tetra Paks. So, uh, so and the different companies they may join forces to introduce a certain new technology or certain new uh, product to the market. Advertising in public relations maybe different companies they can come up with common or different companies within a group they can come up with common advertising themes and they can have common public relation offices. Obligation contracting. Uh, we have already talked about trade associations that people form or the different businesses form uh, also form associations like for example pharmaceutical association of Pakistan or IT, uh, association of IT companies in Pakistan. The main aim is to come up with a common response to different important external environmental changes. Obligation contracting where basically you sign a contract that we are going to develop a, a common technology or we are going to develop a common market. Now you are obliged by the contract to share one another resources or to share your resources with the contracting party. Patent exchange and pooling. People may share their patents or they may share their profits to develop new technology. For example, like Sony Ericsson or Nokia, they have joined hands to develop a common mobile technology. Now, next we want to talk about like how environment, uh, you know, affects the design of different companies or what are certain, you know, elements that it may affect. Now, if you look at your slide, you're seeing a quadrant which has four different quadrants. Now on x-axis, the x-axis represents environment complexity. 
and it says that the environment complexity can be very simple or complex and on the y-axis we have environmental change now the environmental change can be unstable or it can be stable now due to interaction of these different variables four different situations can arise for example an organization may have simple plus stable uh, stable environment now this sort of organization basically enjoys a low uncertainty in the environment now small number of external elements now what are the different characteristics of such an environment or low uncertainty small number of external environments and they are similar elements remain the same or change slowly now the external environment elements you know basically in a stable or a simple environment or an environment with a low uncertainty seldom change or there are very there, there are small number of those elements basically maybe two or three elements which basically are important for a company performing and so operating or doing business in such a uh, business environment or business domain now these elements they remain same or change very slowly for example soft drink bottlers beer distributors local utilities container manufacturers now in the second quadrant the environment changes to low to moderate uncertainty and the environment may be very complex or the environment complexity elements they may be complex but still the environmental change is stable and we term or we label such a condition as low to moderate uncertainty now in such a case basically large number of external elements are present and they are dissimilar for example technology economic conditions um, lending rates customer taste number of elements can be present in the environment and they do not share the same characteristics elements remain the same or they change slowly but at the same time the elements remain the same over the time and they change very slowly for example universities hospitals and insurance companies are example of are some of the examples of companies which operate in such an environment now at the same time we can have a very simple environment with respect to the characteristics of environmental complexity but at the same time the environment from the perspective of uh, from the perspective of environmental change the environment can be unstable so we term such a condition as high moderate uncertainty now in this case small number of external elements are present and they are similar elements change frequently and unpredictable and unpredictably now in such a case though there are certain few number of elements that there that are present in the environment but they are subject to frequent change examples personal computers fashion clothing music industry or toy manufacturers for example we have seen in recent decades that the personal computers the the technology used in such computers changes a lot of time it changes year by year new models comes up on new uh, processors come in on new you know uh, memory uh, capacity changes on new new um, designs are available so every year the personal computer manufacturers they have to incorporate such changes similarly fashion clothing the taste or the preferences of the consumers or the customers who are fashion conscious may change time to time or the trends in the industry may change time to time so such an environment basically though is very simple with respect to complexity but the changes are very frequent so it's highly unstable in the last quadrant we have uh, certain other characteristics for example the environmental complexity may be very high or it may be a very complex environment and at the same time it may be a very unstable environment too that is it is it is subject to frequent changes so we term such an environment or such a condition as high uncertainty so large number of external elements and there's this similar elements change frequently unpredictably and reactively so the environmental changes and number of uh, environmental factors that may affect 
an organization's domain or organization's business and at the same time these factors change very frequently examples american airlines oil companies electronic firms and aerospace firms now if you look at your slide you can see that the uncertainty increases from the first quarter to the last quarter so the, basically the very first quarter is a simple stable environment or the companies operating in the first quadrant enjoy low uncertainty in their business domain and generally their domain remains stable now as the arrow changes it the environment starts becoming complex or unstable and till the time we reach the last quadrant the environment is highly uncertain Now let's take an example, for example we can talk about universities. Now from the two angles of uh, environmental complexity or stability we say that uh, we can think about it and uh, we analyze and see that the environment for the universities is very complex. For example from the government perspectives the fees may change, the number of students may change and the type of awards may change. From the student's perspective, current and perspective one, their parents or the student unions, they may play certain roles. Graduate employers, for example, private, public and private sector, they may have their own demands. They may be after certain, certain kind of degrees may be in high demand, like for example, people graduating with business degrees or people graduating with IT degrees or people graduating with um, engineering degrees maybe their degrees are in high demand both in public and private sector other universities research organizations at home and abroad the university may have may have to lie on with other universities and at the same time with universities operating abroad similarly it may have to face pressure from the unions maybe from the support staff or low grade staff unions or the academic unions and maybe perhaps the uh, or maybe perhaps uh, pressure from the student unions stable is the environment stable generally it is stable yes but maybe currently it's not stable for example like the government wants to change the form and structure of higher education commission now if the structure of higher education commission changes that may have or that may create instability in the environment in which the universities operate and the universities may have to uh, incorporate certain you know elements which may which may affect their businesses or which may affect their operations if there's a change the way HSC is operating in Pakistan right now. There's certain there can be certain other examples. For example, think of a large mobile phone company. What activities in broad term does it engage in? How would you describe its environment in terms of stability and complexity? Does this vary for different parts of the organization? If it does vary, how might the different parts of the organizations may be structured? So this is a question for you to think about. Let's start again. Now we can think about a, uh, about a mobile company. Let's say we talk about uh, Mobilink. So what do you think, uh, or maybe we can talk about a mobile operator and we can say that it's Mobilink. Let's talk about mobile operator first and let's talk about Mobilink. So what do you think? Is the environment complex for Mobilink? Or is it, uh, or is, is it just few elements which may affect the environment? Now, maybe it's the government regulations which may have a lot of effect on their businesses. The terrorism issues uh, which the government of Pakistan faces at the moment may have things for the mobile industry. We have seen on many occasions that the government has, uh, you know, changed its policy with regard to issuance of SIMs to customers. And the government has at time again and again stopped mobile services for certain purposes. If a foreign dignitary visits Pakistan, the mobile services, the mobile phones companies, they have to stop their services. If there is some important occasion like uh, Muharram or Eid Namaz, the government stops the mobile phone services. Now all these decisions they have to do. They have to do with the complexity in the environment. Now, 
apart from that there are few big mobile operators in Pakistan so maybe they can cope with these elements if they can have some sort of uh, you know coordination mechanisms they can come up with a single policy to respond to these environmental changes so do you think it's a stable environment at the moment we can say that it's a stable environment but it may be subject to change but at the moment all of these companies are enjoying good business in Pakistan so the environment may be very stable now if you think about a mobile manufacturer what do you think about that like do you think uh, is it a stable environment for Apple or for Nokia or Samsung to operate in now it's a very complex environment in a sense that uh, people taste and preferences change altogether once people were quite happy with keypad mobile phones uh, or with mobile phones that had keypads now maybe people are more happy with touch phones now people want to use internet or other services on their mobile phones banking services for example now mobile phone company manufacturers had to incorporate such changes and then again the recession is one of the reasons maybe they, they it may affect their sales so they have to think about all these environmental elements but at the same time is it stable yes to a certain extent it is a stable environment but highly complex so maybe in your time you can think about it maybe you can visit the websites of these mobile companies or the mobile manufacturers and you can gather certain information from their websites which may help you think about like is their environment stable or is their environment complex now that that has certain implications for the organization structure too and we we are going to talk about in a minute about in a minute we are going to talk about like uh, what are those certain implications for the organization structure or change uh, that in uh, for these companies that implications for these companies now before we talk about like uh, how organizational you know uh, environment or how environment has certain important implications for change or the organization design principles we can basically take an overview like generally we have two models to design an organization one is termed as mechanistic model and the other one is termed as organic now we say that they are mechanistic or organic organizations so what are their responsibilities basically the characteristics of a mechanistic organization are task spe specialization and separation they are high in task specialization and separation precise and rigid role definitions the job you perform is well defined or the job specification and description is high and you know what your job is basically vertical coordination of task centralization of knowledge and control vertical communication of instructions and decisions loyalty to the firm and obedience to superiors so basically mechanistic organizations basically they are if you if you think about these characteristics it gives us some it gives us a clear message and the message is that these organizations are basically designed on the principles of ford or on the principles of bureaucracy so they have high task specialization and spe separation each task is divided into sub tasks or division of labor is very high and the people know exactly know what their job specifications and descriptions are generally there's a vertical coordination of tasks that means that the management or the senior managers are responsible to coordinate or to organize or plan the task there's a high centralization of knowledge and control like all the knowledge and control rests with the top management vertical communication generally the communication is just one way and that is from top to down loyalty to the firm is emphasized and generally the employees are expected to be obedient towards their superiors now in relation to the mechanistic organizations another way to organize your organizations is called organic structures or organic organizations now they have task and skill integration 
Now there is no, they are not high in task specialization or they do not separate the specializations, but they have task and skill integration. Meaning basically one person may perform more than one task and may be trained in more than one skills so that he's able to perform a couple of tasks. Diffuse and flexible roles. They don't have precise and rigid role definitions. And there's no clear cut job description and specifications in organization, organic organizations. You may be expected to work in different part of the organization and you must be ready to have, or you must be ready to play flexible roles. There are multiple coordination and responsibilities. Many may be team is responsible for coordination or there are multiple, multiple levels in uh, there are multiple managerial levels which are responsible for coordination and and have different responsibilities maybe the team the team leader the first level management they are also responsible to plan and organize the work and they are responsible for the quality or the outcomes of their work too diverse sources of knowledge and expertise the employees themselves they may be highly knowledgeable and they may be expert in their jobs this is quite different from you know the mechanicist structure where o where only the top management they are considered to be experts or where the only the top management they are the source of the knowledge now as compared to such a mechanistic structure an organic structure the employees are highly knowledgeable workers and they are experts in their own fields there may can be multiple channels of communication. Uh, the communication can be from top to down. The communication can be from down to top. The, the communication can be oral. The communication can be written. Or the communication can be electronic. So there are multiple channels to communicate in such an organization. And these channels are, channels are available for information and advice. There is commitment to task and to expertise as compared to commitment to the firm and obedience to superiors in case of in case of organic organizations the commitment is to the task and to expertise there are certain other ways to deal with the environmental uncertainty for example certain organizations they create buffer departments or they do buffering so what are the buffer departments basically such organization they separate their core employees from interaction with the environment or the core employees of the organization they do not have to interact or they do not have to worry about the organizational changes or sorry the environmental changes rather a separate department is created and that department is responsible to analyze the changes in the environment and to judge its implications for the organization or for the different parts of the organization. So there's a separate department or the, what is a buffering technique. A buffering technique is that the core group or the core employees, they do not need to worry about the changes in the environment. Only there's a separate dedicated department. How they, uh, there are certain other ways the organizations, they deal with the environmental uncertainty. One of the way is to create a buffer or it's called the technique is called buffering now what's what's this technique in this technique the core employees or the core workers of the organization they do not need to worry about the changes in the in the environment and how those changes are going to affect the business of the organization apart from that a separate dedicated department is created which is responsible to analyze the environmental changes and to judge the impact of such changes on the organization business now these separate departments they can basically what they do is that they gather certain intelligence the intelligence may be with regard to the environmental changes or with regard to the competitors or with regard to what the competitors are doing what new products are entering the markets so basically they gather intelligence and they analyze that intelligence and they come up with certain implications or they come up with certain proposals how that how those changes are going to affect the environment of the organization or the business of the organization now there are certain other ways too and the other way is called boundary another way is boundary spanning 
Now boundary spanning is pretty much the same thing as buffering is, but in the case of boundary spanning, the, they just not only analyze the environment which affects our business, but they also try to change the environment. Now this, is a, now this is very important to understand that in buffering you are just analyzing the environment and you're trying to analyze how those changes are going to affect your business. But in the case of boundary spanning, you do not only analyze the environment, but you also respond to those changes in a way that you can lower the uncertainty prevailing in the environment. So maybe for example, we have already talked about that maybe uh, certain association or pharmaceutical associations they also come up with the strategy how to influence the environment certain changes in the environment to an extent they can do that maybe they can influence the government to change its policy leading to differentiation within organization another way is that you can differentiate the different departments of the organizations now that can help you to Basically, you can, you know, uh, if a certain department is like, for example, let's take an example of research and development. If there's, uh, there's a lot of changes in the technology of mobile, the way the mob and mobile manufacturers operate or the technology they use to manufacture mobile phones, now to cater to that environment, they can differentiate between rest of the environment, between rest of the company and R&D departments. Maybe for R&D departments, they can collaborate with other mobile manufacturers and they can pool up their resources and share the common developed technology. So what we mean by differentiation within organization, the certain departments within an organization may be more prone towards the changes in the environment. Now to overcome those changes or to cope with those changes, what they do is that they differentiate those departments from the other departments of the organization. They may have or they may develop a separate structure or they may organize those departments differently. Like, let's take an example and the example is let's say Nokia and Samsung, they have joined hands. So they have differentiated their R&D departments so that they can share the common technology that comes into existence as a as a result of this collaboration. Similarly, many pharmaceutical companies, they do collaboration in drug development so that they can lower the cost of research and development and at the same time they can use the expertise of one another. Now, there are certain other questions for you to think about. Take an example of a mobile phone company again and uh, think about what are the priorities of those involved in different activities, research and development likely to be. Will they adopt a short term or long term perspective on those activities? What level of formality would you associate with each activity and why? Now, if we say Nokia and Samsung, do you think uh, it's a good idea for them to share research and development cost? Uh, it's a good idea for them to collaborate between one another to come up with new technologies. Should this perspective be short term or long term? It should be definitely, it should be a long term perspective. Why? Because if you want to share the cost of research and development or if you want to develop a common technology or a new technology, then that cannot be done in a year or so. It takes a long time to come up with new ideas. It takes a time to, to develop new technology or to commercialize new technology. So should these processes be formal? Yes, they have to be formal. There should be certain contracts or there should be certain mechanism through which these processes are evaluated. To this, to, to, there should be certain, you know, um, formal procedures or formal mechanisms which deal with these sort of joint ventures or these sort of collaborations and there should be certain mechanisms in existence which can evaluate the performance of such common departments or such common efforts. Now we again we see um, 
um, like we have talked about that the companies can differentiate between within two like that the companies can differentiate within their different departments to cope up with environmental uncertainty so how different departments of a company they differ from one another what are their different characteristics and do they really need to differentiate or not so we say that we choose three departments let's say research and development manufacturing and sales so the characteristics can be priorities for example R&D basically they, their priority is to develop new quality products or to develop new developments manufacturing maybe their priority is to efficiently manufacture the products sales maybe their priority is customer satisfaction so they have different focuses now you know you see that R&D they are focused to develop new pro products or services manufacturing they have focused to come up with less expensive and quality products or with cheap and quality products so their focus is on so their focus is on efficiency similarly the sales are concerned with customers so they focus on customer satisfaction time horizon r and d departments they have a long time horizon manufacturing they have very short time horizons and similarly sales they have short time horizons too why because if you want to do research and development it may, it may take five years it may take ten years but manufacturing you ha they have very short targets maybe within six months they need to improve their productivity similarly sales they need to increase their market share in the next year or so they cannot wait for ten years or a long time to increase their market share or to come up with a strategy to develop or to come up with a strategy to a focus on customer satisfaction dominant interpersonal orientation of employees R&D they're task oriented manufacturing again they're task oriented sales they may be process oriented formality of the structure R&D very low because they have to be informal the teamwork teamwork is high they have to have high interaction between other so their structure may be as very informal manufacturing generally they are high in formality or the structure is well defined similarly sales maybe they are high in structure too or the structure is well defined now we can take example of uh, three different um, manufacturers maybe one manufacturer man manufactures some plastic products other one is in the business of food and there's another one which is in containers business now we talk about uh, from the point of uncertainty and integrators like do they need to coordinate with, uh, with the environment or do they need to coordinate with other industries or other people or other businesses in the environment uncertainty this was it we are talking about uncertainty and integration environmental uncertainty may be if you're a plastics manufacturer the environmental uncertainty may be high if you're in a food business maybe there's a moderate environmental uncertainty if it's container still again very low uncertainty departmental differentiation plastics very high foods moderate containers low management and integrating roles maybe for the plastics business they need a high level of coordination for the foods a little low for the containers maybe they do not need to coordinate with the other industries so there's no need for integrators now we go back again to our diagram or uh, the um, model we have used to see how environmental complexity and environmental change you know affects uncertainty in the environment and how it affects the businesses of the environment or the structures or the way the organizations operate we go back to it again and we see how the structure of an organization may change with these changes in the complexity of the environment or the stability of the environment how the structure of the organization may vary so we have already talked about that the there are different four levels like for example the environment may be low in uncertainty it may be low to moderate in uncertainty it may be very high and high to moderate in uncertainty or they may enjoy a high uncertainty in the environment now let's take 
the first quadrant that is low uncertainty and environment which is basically stable and very simple and we have taken examples like maybe bottle manufacturers, soft drink bottlers, etc., ice cream manufacturers, you know, soap manufacturers, such examples. So generally, if the environment is low in uncertainty, the organizations operating in such environment, they have mechanistic structures. Their structures are formalized and centralized. There may be few departments. They do not need any integrating roles. They are generally, their orientation is operational and they have little imitation or they are not bothered about what the competitors are doing or they do not try to imitate the competitors. Low to moderate uncertainty, again they may have mechanistic structures. The structures may be formal and centralized. They may have many departments and there may be some boundary spanning. Few integrating roles may be required. They may need certain planning and they may have certain tend tendency towards imitating the products of the custom of the competitors. Now, if the environment is high to moderate in uncertainty, generally in this case, the organizations may have organic structures. They may have, they may be high in teamwork. They may be informal and decentralized. Few departments, much boundary spanning may be required. There may be few integrating roles. They are generally planning oriented and they are quick to imitate the products or services of their customers or their competitors, sorry. Uh, sorry, uh, it's competitors, not customers. Now, in the fourth quadrant, the businesses operating in the four quadrants, they may have high uncertain or they, have a, they may have a high level of uncertainty in the environment. In such cases, Generally, they enjoy organic structure. The emphasis is on teamwork, informal, and decentralized structures. They may have many departments, and the de departments may be differentiated from another, or they may have many departments that are basically differentiated. Extensive boundary spanning. They may have many integrating roles. They may require extensive planning and forecasting, and they may have extensive imitation policies. So basically now finally after taking into account different aspects of external environment we have come up with a model that explains how the environment changes and how we can respond by changing the structure of an of our organization to cope up with the uncertainty in the environment. We have already talked that there are basically four conditions or four situations that exist in the environment. The environment may be low in uncertainty. The environment may be low to moderate in uncertainty. The environment may be high to moderate in uncertainty or there may be high uncertainty in the environment. Now depending upon the situation of the environment, the companies may have mechanistic structure or organic structure. They may have few departments or they may have many departments. They may require integrating roles or they may not require any integrating roles. They may be just operational oriented companies or maybe they do plan certain things or they do forecast and do certain planning. They may be very slow or they may, may not need to imitate their competitors or depending again depending on the environment they may need to do extensive imitation. Now, what's the conclusion? The conclusion of today's lecture is the external environment is likely to influence the ways in which any company as a whole is designed as well as the ways in which the individual departments and divisions within it are designed. So basically, the conclusion of today's lecture is The conclusion of today's lecture is that external environment impacts the way a company is designed. Not only the way the a company is designed, but also the way the different departments within the company are organized. So today, dear students, basically the objective of our lectures were, or today the objectives of the lecture, lectures are, to consider how environments vary and affect the internal structures and processes of organizations. Basically today we wanted to know 
that how the environment affects the internal structures and internal processes of an organization. We wanted to develop a framework to understand how the environment changes and how the managers might need to respond to those changes. Now we started with different um, models of coordination and influence and we talked about how basically to cope with environmental uncertainty organizations they develop coordination and influence mechanisms. Now they can be within the industry or within the business domain a company or an owner may have May, ha may have stakes in different companies and they are termed as ownership links. They may be like for example you may be shareholder or you may be owner of different companies like for example in case of Pakistan there are many big businesses which own many different companies in diverse fields. For example Lexan group of industries they have Lexan tobacco they have certain other businesses similarly maybe Unilever Pakistan, PNG, um, Packages Limited, they own different many, many different businesses. So they have ownership links in those businesses. Or basically the owner is the same. They may have contractual links. Maybe they have an alliance or a joint venture, etc. They may have interlocking directories. They may transfer an exchange of executives and senior managers. There may be certain sort of exchange going on between different companies. They may exchange their senior executives to learn from one another. They may pool their profits or they may form federations. They may come up with cooperative marketing. Maybe they share their budgets to co develop common advertising uh, strategy or public relations strategy. They may have trade associations to influence the environment. There may, be, there may be certain contracting obligations where you are going to cooperate to respond to the environmental changes. They may exchange their patents or they may exchange or they may pool their patents to come or to overcome certain financial limitations or to come overcome certain environmental constraints. With the example, with the, with the help of number of examples, we have tried to understand and uh, these different ownership links and we have talked like for example maybe cross shareholding is one of the ways in which uh, a same company or one company has shares in other companies too. Similarly you know one big group owns different industries for example we have talked about Bank of Tokyo, Mitsubishi Heavy Industries, Mitsubishi Electric, Kiran Bury, they are all owned by Mitsubishi Group. Similarly, Toyota owns Tokaya Bank, Toyota itself, and Recock, among many other companies. Similarly, we have talked about that individual owners, they own number of companies. The example was, and there was an example from Arab Emulation Group, and we came to know that Dan Sri Dato and Azman Hashmi, they own number of companies under the group name, Arab Malaysian Group. Similarly, companies may form joint ventures, and they may have interlocking directorates, and they may develop cooperative marketing techniques, they may come up with common advertising and public relations strategy, they may use the platform of their associations to respond to certain policy changes or maybe they are obliged by the contracts to respond to those changes or to share resources to respond to those changes. Now one important framework we used here to understand these changes was uh, basically it had two axes. One was environmental complexity and the other one was environmental change and uh, we have talked about that the environment can be very simple or it can be complex. Similarly, the change in the environment, it may be a stable environment or it may be highly unstable environment. Or with regard to the change, the change in the environment may be very stable or the environment may be very unstable. So we came up for with, with four different quadrants. We said that the environment may be low in uncertainty, 
it may be it may vary from low to moderate uncertainty or it may have high to moderate uncertainty similarly the environment may be very high and un in uncertainty so basically what we talked about was that um, in a simple and stable environment there are small number of environmental elements that may affect the domain of the business the elements generally remain same or do not change and we took the examples of uh, some generic products maybe like soft drink bottlers local utilities beer distributors or juice manufacturers or ice cream marketers etc the environment may be low to moderate and uncertainty for example large number of external elements may be present in the environment and they may be different they are different from one another elements remain the same or they change slowly though there are large number of elements in the environment or they are dissimilar in their nature but they do not change frequently for example universities hospitals or insurance companies we had a third case where the environment may be high to moderate and uncertainty this means small number of external elements but they do change very frequently for example industries like computing fashion clothing music industry or toy manufacturers similarly in the last case or in the last quadrant we had an environment which was highly uncertain this means large number of external elements and they are quite dissimilar and elements change frequently un predictably and reactively for example airline business oil companies electronic firms and aerospace firms with the, with the help of an example we took an example of universities and universities and we tried to think about is there an environment complex or stable or not or in which quadrant you can place them similarly we took an example of mobile phone companies and we thought about or talked about either they represent a stable environment or is the environment complex or not then another important concept we talked about that generally organizations they have either they have mechanistic structure or they have organic structures and we have talked about how these two structures basically differ from one another there were the, we talked about certain other ways the organizations respond to the environmental uncertainty uncertainty and we uh, we said that um, generally the organizations they can create buffer departments or they can do boundary spanning and they do these things to protect their core employees from the environmental changes so that the core employees do not need to worry about the environmental changes but they are dedicated departments which analyze information or which gather intelligence from the environment and analyze it and prioritize how the organization is going to respond to those changes so rest of the employees they do not need to worry about such changes again we said that uh, organizations they may differentiate between their departments because different departments they have different priorities different departments they have different time horizons there may be different sort of interpersonal orientation of employees within those departments and the structures may be there the structures within or the structural requirements may be different be between different departments of an organization similarly depending upon the businesses and the uncertainty present in that domain of the business you may require few or you may require extensive integration or you may require number of integrators basically integrators what they mean that you may require a high level of coordination depending upon the uncertainty prevailing in your business domain finally we had a relook at the framework and we said that depending upon what sort of quadrant a business lies in either it's uh, it lies in a quadrant which is which has a low uncertainty or it may lie in a quadrant which has high in uncertainty the organizations they can have different structures or they can design their organization differently depending upon what the external environment suggests them or what sort of external environment they are operating in and they may design their or organizations or they may change their organizations accordingly for example in a low uncertainty environment they may have mechanistic structures the structure may be highly centralized they may just need few departments 
they may know they may not require any coordination or they may not require any integrating roles their orientation may be just operational and they are not worried about what sort of products their competitors introduce but and another example can be of, a, of an industry which operates in a high uncertain environment now they may require organic structures they may be high in teamwork they may have informal rules and regulations and they may be they are high in decentralization they may have many differentiated departments and they may have extensive boundary spanning there may be many requirements for coordination between different departments of the organization and they may have many integrators present they may require extensive planning and forecasting and they may be very quick to imitate or they may do extensive imitating with respect to what different products or with respect to the products and services their competitors introduce in the market so basically what we have talked today is that external environment is likely to influence the ways in which any company as a whole is designed as well as the ways in which individual departments and divisions within it are designed kya humne iska conclusion kya hai conclusion ye hai ki external environment jo hai wo na sirf company ko affect karti hai balki the way it is designed and the way the individual departments and divisions within the company are also designed depend upon the external environment in which the business operates dear students that's what we wanted to do today or that's all we wanted to talk about today now in the next lecture on in the next two lectures that is lecture 9 and 10 with the help of a case study we are going to see how the external the or the changes in the environment have changed the structure of the com of a company so that's all for today khuda hafiz